everybody. I'm really happy you're here tonight. And we're going to be something doing something uh, a little unusual. Um, rather than just uh, theater and poetry and song, we're going to be doing some science. And I'm really happy to welcome Sarah Oktai, the scientist and poet uh, who spent most of her life uh, on the borders between land and sea, uh, 12 or eight years, 12 years at uh, the Nantucket Field Station. Um, and then now you did a stint in Colorado and the West Coast, and now you're back here. Uh, I got to know Sarah, not in person first, but by her writings. Uh, I had use of a house every spring in Nantucket, and one of my rituals was uh, in taking the ferry boat, I would read yesterday's island, which was the island newspaper. And I would be you know, reading these essays by this person who was like totally engaging me in uh, technical jargon about the sea or the horseshoe crabs or fog or whatever it was. And um, you know, I just sort of really uh, fell in love with her writing. And uh, authors often say, if you want to know me, then read my books. And so uh, I'm happy to say that Sarah, and I, when I did finally get to know her through her husband, Len, who is a poet, uh, when we started hanging out, um, I said, you know, I've read your essays so many, you know, over so many years, you really have to put these together. This is, this is a book, and she has, uh, and I'm happy to say she's coming out with the first volume, which will be Nat Naturally Nantucket to Sea, volume one of four. There will be eight, eight years of essays, about 175 in all, four volumes, two related to the sea, two related to the land. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you this one question, uh, if I may, because uh, you're on the border here. and between land and sea, and you could also include sky. I mean, actually, you know, you're out 26 miles of, out at sea, so the sun rises and sets into the sea, which is quite unusual on the East Coast. But this came to me from an article I read back in 1988 by the visionary Marilyn Ferguson. And she wrote uh, an article uh, for the Whole Earth, Whole Earth News, and I'll read it to you. And this is what I wanted to talk about. Visionaries belong to the group that Henry Miller called the Granzenvolk, or the border people. They are the culture scouts. Edges may, in fact, be the key. According to one theory, evolutionary changes occur in a surprisingly short time under certain conditions of stress. Species living at the edge of their normal habitat tend to mutate more rapidly. Sarah, the culture scout, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, thank you, uh, first of all, Richard, for having me here. And it's really kind of you to be such a fan of my essays. Yeah, as a chemical oceanographer, actually, all the action does happen in the edges, in our harbors and along the border. I mean, in the ocean, 99% of the excitement happens in the first centimeter of water, same at the bottom of the sediment. So, and, and it's very true, if you look in a big field, most of the biodiversity is occurring right at the edge of that field where it merges into woods. So um, I, I have never heard that quote, but I mean, that's that's really fascinating. And, and the borders are, and pushing those borders are really what um, I think people should, should look at and should be concerned about. So when we're in science concerned about parts of the planet, we often look at those borders. And in mm -hmm. some of the things we'll discuss today, that the big border is the temperature border. And we're seeing that all over America and all over the world where creatures are moving farther north, some other creatures are moving farther south, and uh, the borders are being challenged in, in many ways uh, as far as where um, plants and animals used to live and where they need to live now. So um, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, most of the ocean is actually, there's not a lot of action if you're ever you know, taking a boat all the way across the Atlantic. It's, um, there's not a lot going on until you reach a border that's created by currents or by uh, sea life, like the Sargasso Sea is just a big border where a big, you know, circulation of creatures has created this whole little planet. Cool quote. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Do um, you want to just jump in or do you want me to? Sure. I'm happy to jump in. Okay. Um, 
Thank you again for having me. I'm very excited to meet everyone here. Um, I am a scientist who's just kind of started to dabble in, in writing. My husband is the real poet and has been writing forever. We both ran a venue on Nantucket for 10 or 12 years, featuring poets from all over the world. And so I uh, eventually, um, some of that got absorbed into uh, my psyche, as we'll find out. But what I was going to try today is to um, read a essay that I've written and then read a poem that would go with that essay. And that should be like 15 minutes. You're welcome to jump in and, and interrupt me though, um, but we'll leave some time for questions. And then I have another essay and another poem. And then at that point, we'll see where we're at and if we wanna hear any more poetry. But um, I've timed this, so hopefully it's not too long or too boring, but just hold up your hand and try to stop me. And I'll actually be, after the essay, I'm gonna show a PowerPoint too. So it's gonna be a multimedia, multiple ways for me to fail. Um, but anyway, thanks again for having me. Uh, I'm back on the East Coast now. I'm at the new executive director for the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, Mass. And I'm very excited about that job. And that's my new gig. So I get to work with humpback whales and right whales, fisheries, um, people doing uh, side scan sonar. And as a chemical oceanographer, my, my background is to know a little bit about all of these. So without further ado, I'm going to start with, uh, and these are coming out, um, the first book will, and this, this, both of the essays tonight will be in the first book. Uh, hopefully it will be coming out at Christmas, and uh, I'm busy doing the references right now. And the name of this essay, which came out originally in August 6th of 2015, is called Impacting the Globe, the Anthropocene. In August of 2015, I was fortunate to be hosting journalist Andy Refkin for an on-island event to support the Organization of Biological Field Stations, or OBFS, in my role as the president of OBFS. Andy was the science and environmental beat writer for the New York Times for 14 years and wrote an excellent science blog for the New York Times called Dot Earth for nine years. He has written extensively on climate related issues, including the evolution of the Arctic and the crisis of communication that stymies many scientists as they try to describe their methods and conclusions to a public that's unsure of the scientific process. He now is the founding director of the new initiative on communication and sustainability at Columbia University's Earth Institute. The reason I bring him up tonight is Andy coined the term Anthropocene in his mm -hmm. book, Global Warming, Understanding the Forecast, all the way back in 1992, in which he wrote, we are entering an age that might someday be referred to as, say, the Anthropocene. After all, it is a geological age of our own making. The name evolved into the term scientists use now of Anthropocene. Anthropo from the Greek words anthropos for human and scene for new. So the newest age is the age of man and not in a good way. This is used to describe the current geologic age as one in which human impacts are causing ecosystem-wide change and have become the dominant driver of many earth processes. Andy reminded me of a group that came here, in this case here was Nantucket, for the 2010 Living on the Edge Coastal Community Conference called Atlantic Rising. This group was a two-year charitable project created by three young Brits named Tim Bromfield, Will Lorimer, and Len Morris, who traveled the world showing people what a one-meter sea level rise would look like on the ground. They took their blogs and videos and other material and morphed it into educational resources for students between the ages of 12 and 15. I spoke with this group and I was really impressed by their mission and their ability to viscerally show an average person what sea level rise would look like. They filmed a video with Andy with high school students on Nantucket working with a local surveyor to measure and mark the one meter level at Brant Point, which is a famous lighthouse that you see when you come onto Nantucket. They used yellow caution tape to show where the sea would actually be with a one meter rise would occur, which is what is occurring. I don't think we actually need caution tape to remember that Nantucket, if you haven't been there, like many other low-lying islands, is very vulnerable to sea level rise. 
Um, the recent winter storms over the past three years, and this would have been in 2013 to 2015, have drilled into Nantucketers the need to plan for sea level rise and to prepare for these storms. The town of Nantucket developed a coastal management plan that I helped write to address town owned land in harm's way from storm surge and erosion little geology lesson, the Cape and the Islands were formed during the Wisconsin glaciation period when a lobe of the Laurentide ice sheet, named the Laurentide after the Laurentian region of Canada, where it's first formed, pushed rocks and debris south as it flowed over the area. In fact, the ice sheet moved back and forth a few times, which is called advancing and retreating, basically making folds, just like pushing your hand along a sheet on a bed. Eventually, it stopped right along the area on Nantucket, where we have a few hills on the northern side. This line is called a terminal moraine, and there are adjacent ones formed from other glacial lobes forming the backbone of hills that can be seen along Martha's Vineyard and the Cape. If you're familiar with areas that have been glaciated, you'll see giant glacier boulders that have been dropped by these glaciers as they melt and retreat. The southern side is mainly outwash plain, or bits of sediment that melted out and stayed there as the ice retreated north as the earth warmed up. The islands became islands as the sea level rose about 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Before that, man or beast could have walked to Nantucket, 26 miles offshore now. The wind and waves started moving the sand around, redistributing it in storms and depositing it just like a pile of sand in a bucket with some water would do if it were swirled around. The sea level rise that created Nantucket's watery moat that separates us from the mainland or America as locals call it, is continuing at a faster pace. The first prediction I made back in 2015 is now uh, that it, the world would be 18 inches higher, that the sea would be 18 inches higher by 2100. That number now is closer to a meter or three to four feet. If you've ever been to Nantucket, you might have noticed it's not very high. Alter Rock, which is one of its iconic hills, is only 100 feet above sea level. And the highest point, Sankety Head, just a little south of Sankety Lighthouse, clocks in at a dizzying 111 feet. If sea level rise stayed consistent at a rate of almost a foot over the last 100 years, we'd have plenty of time to enjoy the island. But it's accelerating, and the loss of marshes and low-lying land means storm surges are going to move inland. The New England area has experienced experience accelerated sea level rise over the past 500 years from one millimeter per year to 2.5 millimeters a year in 1990 to close to three millimeters per year now. These sound like small numbers, but they add up. The most accurate recent estimates for Nantucket can be found at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or NOAA's sea level website. You can see the winners and losers across the nation quite quickly, and I highly advise you to go check it out. And there are far more losers than winners. Right over Nantucket, a yellow arrow pointing up indicates that for Nantucket, the mean sea level trend is 3.58 millimeters per year. Remember, we were just talking three for the rest of Massachusetts, based on a monthly mean sea level data from 1965 to 2014 which is equivalent to 1.17 feet in 100 years. So Massachusetts is a watery state. It's not as watery as Rhode Island, but includes 1,500 miles of tidal shoreline, 78 coastal communities, 681 barrier beaches, and 3,600 people live within 500 feet of a coastal shore. 72% of the Massachusetts shore is exhibiting a long-term erosional trend. And this trend has accelerated since 1950. As I mentioned before, Nantucket has the highest erosion rates in the state with parts of the southern side losing 12 feet per year on average. Storm generated erosion ranges over periods of hours in a tropical cyclone to several days in a nor'easter. Although the storm events are short lived, the resulting erosion can be equivalent to decades of long term gentle erosion. The actual quantity of sediment eroded from the coast is a function of the storm tide elevation relative to the land elevation, the duration of the storm, and the characteristics of the storm waves. 
during severe coastal storms, it is not uncommon for the entire berm, which is the dry area of the beach above the normal high water line, and part of the dune to be removed from the beach. The amount of erosion is also dependent on the pre-storm width and elevation of the beach, so repeated small storms can do a lot of damage because the beach is more vulnerable to sand loss. In fact, the cumulative effects of two closely spaced minor storms can often exceed the impact of one severe storms, as we saw this past spring with the nor'easters Nemo in February and Saturn in March of 2013 occurring not all that long after superstorm Hurricane Sandy and doing more damage than Sandy to many parts of the island. Sandy was the second most costly hurricane in the US at $68 billion, only surpassed, surpassed by Hurricane Katrina. Therefore, although hurricane erosion can be serious and dramatic in the long run, it is the Northeast storms that do the most damage. In January of 2015, winter storm Juno once again battered the island, taking away a large chunk of the barrier beach we would see outside our window at Folgers Marsh, driving sand all the way to Pulpus Road, about a half mile away, and marking a low line near shore shack that used to be my office and home with a mud line, not far from the one deposited by Hurricane Bob in August of 1991. And other lines left by hurricanes and storms like Sandy, Saturn, and Nemo. These two, three, and four foot mud and water lines on the field station beach house remind me of the heights of children on a door frame. Juno also ripped huge refrigerator sized chunks of marsh vegetation and ribbed mussels out of the marsh and hurled them like bowling balls onto the back marsh. By far the damage to the Nantucket fuel station was some of the most extreme I've seen in 12 years. That same storm, Boston endured 24 inches of snow, its largest January storm total accumulation, and the sixth largest storm total on record. And we had a long period with no electricity on island. Now, the fact that our sand moves around helps us recover from storms like these, as the sand moves offshore to form sandbars and shoals protecting the island. Nantucket sand acts as an amoeba or a moving shield. Naturally migrating offshore and back onshore is driven by waves, wind, and tides. Nantucket as an island is relatively nimble and able to adapt to change. But within 200 to 300 years, much of the island will be flooded and only the higher elevations will be still sticking up out of the ocean. One of the tools I use in a talk I give frequently on island is an online topographic based sea level inundation website. It's a lot of words all together, but it's a website where you can look up your address and find out how much trouble you might be in. This website's called FireTree, and it's relatively accurate and based on NASA data. FireTree and other FEMA-based software and online data mappers like NOAA's Digital Coast software allow you to zoom into your street or neighborhood and see what modelers are predicting for sea level rise and storm inundation. If you're familiar with Boston or San Francisco or Miami or Houston or Galveston or New Orleans, I highly recommend you check out these mapping software. They take topography and overlay one, two, or three feet of sea level rise on top of it. Then they let you layer FEMA flood maps and hurricane storm surge to a one or two foot sea level rise. So it actually allows you to see what storm surge can bring in addition to simple sea level rise. It's pretty sobering wake up call when you input a one meter rise in sea level and see most of Cotu, Madiket, and parts of downtown Brant Point and the marsh edges of the field station underwater. So far, island marshes have been relatively stable and have built up to keep pace with the sea, rising sea level. Marshes around the world add sediment in order to keep up with sea level. Unfortunately, sea level rise is over outpacing marsh buildup. If you have a shoreline development project, it can divert the sediment flowing to and along our shores and can hurt the ability of the island or coastal area to adapt to sea level rise. For 12 years, my husband, Len, who's on the call, and I lived on Nantucket, and we had a front row seat during each nor'easter to evaluate coastal erosion. 
You can even input my name and the word Hurricane Sandy and see pictures of what's happening in real time. Changing, perhaps abruptly, to another strange and recent story about the effects of sea level rise and warming temperatures. In 2015, as I was writing this story, the story started circulating on the web describing how climate change and warming seas have led to dolphins moving further north up into the Arctic area as sea ice melts. Polar bears are quickly adapting to this new food store source. In one instance, a bear was observed killing and eating one dolphin and stashing the other one under the ice to eat later. That's an impressive feat that has been seen a few times before when hapless whales get trapped by refreezing ice and devoured by hungry polar bears. In a research paper published in June 2015, polar bears have been spotted eating dolphins in the Arctic for the first time ever by Norwegian scientists who believe global warming could have caused the bears to expand their diet. They normally feed on seals, but John Ars at the Norwegian Polar Institute had photographed dolphins being devoured by a hungry bear. It is likely that new species are appearing in the diet of polar bears due to climate change because new species are finding their way north, he told the agency French Press. As our oceans warm and become more acidic and areas formerly ice covered year round are exposed, stories like this may become commonplace. How humans and other animals adapt to these changing conditions as the Anthropocene progresses will hopefully not be a swan song, but a song of resilience. So that is that essay. And then I'm going to thank you, Richard. Oh. And if I can do two things at once or three things at once, I'm going to read a quick poem while I share a PowerPoint. So here's an example of the Anthropocene. What amazes me and what caused me to write this poem and this essay is this quite frankly kind of shocking that as humans, we have caused so much geologic change that um, we, we have a whole epic, you know, an era named after us. So you can see this would be like Devonian or Mississippian. It's um, the British led working group on the Anthropocene told a geology conference in Cape Town that in their opinion, the Anthropocene epoch began in 1950. And it'll probably go until we're gone, would be my guess. So here's a short poem that is in my book, Shifting Light. Let's see. Shifting, Sifting Light from the Darkness. And I'll put the link in the chat here in a second. The wee book, very thin, very affordable, $8 hard copy, $7.50 Kindle. But here's my um, poem, The Anthropocene. And actually, this will be in my next book. So i will just lie to you, sorry. Long before Kritzchen, Refkin, and Stumer popularized the term Anthropocene, you could see the radioactive evidence in muddy river bottoms and ocean sediments, clear as day, dark as night, of a time when nuclear fallout rained from the sky, the air launched by the Manhattan Project's Trinity test, blasted over the serene white sands of the New Mexican desert. Scientists argue over the beginning of our influence from the dawn of early man taming the fields through the smoke and soot of the industrial age to the reign of the Titans. Birthing nuclear bomb tests with ludicrous names like starfish, bluegill, tightrope, and checkmate, our legacy is littering the geosphere. A stack of black ooze, ash, and clay cannot hide the staccato remnants of Chernobyl nor the smeared faint thumbprint of Three Mile Island. Ironic that these same nuclear gods may be needed to spare us the Armageddon of climate change. These are just a drop in the ocean. Now we're building the temple of a new era, the Anthropocene. Planted crops displacing rainforest, more plastic than fish in the ocean within a decade. Domesticated animals outnumber the wild. Waves of invasive weeds and European bees have elbowed aside natural biodiversity. Still, we are celebrating our total dominance on the way to the graveyard. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. 
So that's 1950 was the uh, year that they marked for the beginning of it. Yes. And with the atomic, because I know when they did explode the first atomic bomb sometime in the in the 40s, the big headline was we have entered the atomic age. And, you know, that's very interesting that they used that, uh, not say the, the industrial revolution, but uh, recently. Yeah, um, yeah, you would think of it, but it took a while for both the industrial revolution and for the atomic age to start accumulating where it was more than just a background noise to everything else. I mean, it's like my generation. <laughs> I was born in 49. So uh, we a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. Uh, or, you know, uh, where do you think, Ken, uh, where do you think things are going? Well, well I, that, what kind of hope, what kind of practical hope do you, can you see or, or possibly see? That, that's the number one question I get asked, whether it is uh, just a person I'm talking to or, you know, someone in government or a celebrity is, you know, why, how can you be positive? How can you keep, a, you know, a smile on your face? The more you know about, you know, how far along we are, how much we've exceeded um, the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we've already blown past several warning signs. We're already blowing past the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and humans are good about engineering their way out of things. I think we're actually, the positive things are plants and animals are showing themselves to be more resilient than we first thought. So they're adapting faster. In fact, one of the take home messages is actually evolution is faster. Uh, than we would have hoped. Um, a lot of animals are moving out of areas. What's interesting is um, in the case of, for instance, female plants at the Rocky Mountain Bio Lab, there are female plants that are migrating up elevation faster than the males. These are plants. They're not you know, things that are mobile, but they're basically setting seed higher and higher to reach their pollinators. And so they're moving up elevation as it gets warmer so that they can stay cooler and be in bloom long enough to get pollinated. So the females are actually making that trip faster than the males. And the reason we know this is because scientists have measured one female plant for 20 years and actually have an idea of what's happened to this single female plant. So the positive things are there's a lot of smart people in the world looking at all of this. There's a lot of people who care. Um, unfortunately, I am in the Greta Thunberg category of a lot of blah, blah, blah at COP26. I mean, a lot of people went there and chatted and made promises um, until the general population basically riots. Uh, governance are not going to do. It's just, you know, they just don't have the motivation. You know, they're going to have to be pushed. Mm -hmm. Some of that push is coming from economics. Um, it's actually cheaper to be environmentally uh, responsible and <laughs> yeah. by far. And so scientists are doing a much better job of saying, showing the markets why it pays to be greener, why it pays to divest yourself of fossil fuels, uh, seeing universities divest themselves. The town of uh, Boston just divested mm -hmm. itself of fossil fuels. That's a really positive step. You have to hit uh, us ourselves in our own pocketbook and, and force ourselves to be good. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have questions? Uh, we're gonna run this sort of like a I don't know, an informal setting rather than have questions at the end. Uh, if you have questions be, uh, from Sarah's this present essay in her poem, uh, feel free to jump in and unmute yourself. I had a question about um, one of the things that I really admire about the work that you do is that you you try and translate it to people, but you're doing it in a way that, yeah, I, I can kind of see why anyone would say, why are you upbeat? But being able to translate to people where they can understand the science and it actually is meaningful. Are there maybe tricks you've learned along the way to kind of like, no, this is really important here. Just listen, I'll put it into terms you can really wrap your head around. Well, and this is, a, that's a great question, Shannon. Thank you. And I'm going to beg my husband to actually mute so I don't have an echo in the other room. Um, but 
kids like Greta Thunberg are, are really one of the reasons that we're optimistic when they survey students from zero to 19. They all believe in climate change. They all have taken the ride and, and they understand how important it is. So usually if I'm talking to a family, I typically point to their children and go, you know, your children are going to live a worse life because they're going to have to pay you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to account for erosion control. The storms are really, storms are a pretty big wake up call, even though they're just one of many evidences of climate change, but they wake people up when you have hurricane after hurricane, the ocean has to be at a certain temperature, super hot to generate the, the, the fuel for all these hurricanes and storms to be so, strong and so frequent. And so storms definitely help wake up people. Children help wake up people. When I'm talking to people, I say, you know, look at your kids, what kind of, you know, and we've been saying this for years and that's worked with pollution. I mean, we've gotten rid of DDT. We've gotten rid of lead in the atmosphere from leaded gas. Um, up until a few years ago when we had a president didn't get it, we had very clean air and water, made huge strides in cleaning up our environment. And often those are led by children and by people who care. So even my very conservative family members who I don't agree with on much um, agree that climate change is real. Uh, the other thing that's always tricky is trying to, and a lot of times they say, okay, it's real and we've done it, but so what, you know, we can't undo it. Um, and to some extent, they're partially right, because right now the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is going to last about 100 to 200 years, but we can start scaling back just with like miles per gallon automobiles, you know, that's like saying, well, all cars should only get 15 miles per gallon. No, we can have cars that get 30 or 40 or 50. Um, there, there are ways around that. Um, one of the places where I do lose my patience is people who are talking about like batteries and, you know, oh, well, if we have solar batteries, we're going to create all this pollution. Well, we know how to sequester pollution. We know how to sequester nuclear pollution. We know how to, how to have this material in places where it can't be protected and doesn't escape like Three Mile Island. So uh, I consider that a non-starter because that's usually people who are like, oh, it's too expensive. We can't, you know, we can't switch from fossil fuels. It's just so much cheaper. Well, well no one's going to ask you. I've got another one. Yeah, <laughs> please thinking, do. Yeah. Um, sea level rise. I, I guess most people think that it all kind of uh, rises at the same level everywhere, but that's not true, right? And I especially thinking because I know I've got a bunch of California people on here, it's rising much slower there. Is that true? But it's true. Yeah, it's a rockier, you know, and it's not as, you know, there's not as many parts of California that are actually below 10 meters. Um, so there are areas in San Francisco, they're going to be inundated, but I just read right before I got on today and I was trying to, I don't know if I kept that link, but I might have still got, no, darn it. I closed it. It was a great link. It was talking to a geologist at the University of Oregon, a, a geochemist, and he was saying, it's not sea level rising. It's more like sea levels rising in a big bucket as we shake it around and it slops over here and there and it gets tilted right and left. <laughs> and that's exactly true. Mm -hmm. um, I have several other essays in the book. So there's parts of the planet that were pushed down by the glaciers and those are bouncing back up. And so parts of California are bouncing up because of volcanoes. They've actually got a heat source underneath them that's pushing them up. So in the, one of the few cases where earthquakes and volcanoes are a good thing, it's helping some areas are actually having rebound. Other areas like Texas and Louisiana are subsiding. And so their localized sea level rise is much greater because the land is sinking. Uh, in addition, there's all kinds of storm surges. Marshes make a big difference as to what happens with sea level rise. So you can have localized sea level rise that's greater in some areas than others. That's, that's a great question. So I wish I could find that whole quote because he really described it super well. He's like, no, it's just like a washing machine. It's not like yeah. a a bathtub, it's, it's, it's a bathtub where someone's, you know, throwing in, you know, whisks and, and uh, shaking it and, and jostling it all. And that happens with uh, waves and with atmospheric conditions. Looks like Diane has her hand raised. Yes, uh, I don't know what my state of video is, but um, 
I really appreciate this talk and would love to have you post the link in the chat to the um, sea level rise in different geographical areas. Um, I'm living in the Berkshires and it, my house is at a thousand feet and it's falling apart in a number of directions, but over the last 10 years, I've started to feel attached to it just for the fact that it's so, so, so far elevated. And um, I have several California cousins that are talking about moving east. So um, that's their, they're selecting based on fire, you know, fire danger. And they are looking for the place that they can do the most good for their lives and their children um, the, with, where a natural disaster won't happen. And, you know, we do have floods in the Berkshires, but they generally aren't as severe because everything's so chopped up. Yeah, the Berkshires, I have to say that's part of the reason Lenny and I are here. I was in California. I was actually running a field station in Napa that burnt to the ground just uh, two years ago. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 2020, wow. every, every single, and my colleague was running the 4,000 uh, acre field station next to me, and his house burnt down with everything in it. I mean, he, he and his wife and kids got out, but he lost everything. Wow. Um, so, and the wildfires are very oppressive um, and they are definitely changing. Oh, thank you for putting that flood map. And thank I have you. links. If you just Google Oktai, O-K-T-A-Y plus sea level rise, you'll get links to all the Yesterday Islands articles. And then I'm putting those all together into a book. What's where I'm cautious is I wrote these in 2011, 2014, 2015, where scientists are freaking out is everything's accelerating really faster mm -hmm. than what every scientist predicted. Um, and year to year, you're like, oh my God, I thought it was going to rise a foot a year. Now it's two feet a year. Oh, oh crap. It's already three feet. You can't even get the words out of your mouth before the numbers are changing. Um, and that's true for a lot of subjects, whether it's bees or wildfires or it's Things are, all of these systems are, are adapting quickly, but they're also changing quicker than, uh, than many scientists actually felt was possible. Um, and that's, you know, a, a concern. Uh, the, the big mm. problem in California, too, is the drought where we were in Sacramento. It had not rained and, and at all in seven months. We, and we had right. seven 7.92 inches of rain in 2020 and it'd been the last time it had rained before we moved was March of this year. So it had been seven months and we moved uh, October 28th. So and you're uh, living in what you're living in the Berkshires now. No, I now I'm on, I'm Cape Cod. I'm, I'm right, on, okay, yes. on the Cape. Yeah. So we moved right, no, all the way. I, have, from I, I know Nantucket. I have a, a project there and um, yeah, I should write to the, person to find out what where the house is yeah and see how on I your map there. absolutely yeah now we're on east ham and i i did pay very close attention to exactly where my house is on east ham <laughs> and we're on a little hill and in fact i get a lot of phone calls from people on nantucket that are like i'm thinking about buying this property can you tell me if that's a good idea <laughs> um which is a little stressful and um <laughs> well thank you um, again Oh, you're welcome. Well, and I have one more. Um, I have one more poem. Well, I have many more poems, but I have one more poem and one more essay if people want to hear them on. Uh, oh, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep reading, man. This is awesome. Okay, okay great. Um, well, I'm going to read in this case, the poem first. And if I can uh, pat my head and read at the same time, I'm actually going to advance these slides too. So this is a poem called Zen Geology. I'm going to read this my road and hopefully you can hear me and um, after that I'm going to read an essay on horseshoe crabs which I noticed my husband was psychically talking about earlier today so zen geology here's a beautiful picture of the cuspate spits on Nantucket which are formed by natural circulation in the harbor in fact we used to live just to the right up there so, Zen geology. The angle of repose gives pyramids the form they long to inhabit. They stay where they are. Sand and rock tumble and stop. Altitude, steepness, and stability fashion a template where gravity dictates where we belong. Chaos nature, wild, fathomless turmoil, slowly patterns form. Petals stretch out in spirals, 
produced through infinite means. Galaxies reflected in every swirl. Atoms hugged the rails, followed tangible blueprints drawn with electrons and necessity. Awakening green, gray, white limestone weathers. Stop motion images, rain and wind slough the rock. Soft sculpture revealed, pure presence. Pink veined granite puts up a fight, resists change, while harbors fill with silt. These mountains wear down, shed skin, evolve, become still. We are wearing down, forming the shapes we were meant to fill, the lies we were meant to lead. Colored in, not always in the lines, we age, mellow, character deepens. Blunts insecurities, pettiness, and fear. Faults funnel pressurized lava, feelings surface and cool. Holes form, water gyres gouge depressions, file down the sharp edges. Create tide pools, miniature oceans, cramped living quarters. Starfish and anemones wave, basking in the soft pool of lunar motion. Pink coral colonies grow, a metropolis of symbiotic creatures, a carnival of souls. Atolls doomed to lie in piles on pink beaches in thousands of years. Fine black sand blankets the shoreline born of cataclysmic explosions, basalt screaming hurled from earth to sky, fetuses wrenched from molten depths. Locks protect hidden treasures, frigid depths, giant sturgeon. Glaciated shape mimics deep hold boats, bathtubs filled with peat. Step locks ferry fishing boats up and down a liquid staircase, a 50 foot pyramid of water a testament to man's desire to, re to resist their Buddha nature. Mm. Wow. Thank that you. That is great, yeah. I have a question for you. Are you still taking questions? Absolutely, yeah. bring them on. Um, when you are surrounded by a lot of people who look at the um, changes that's in geography and say, look, we weren't around that moment something hit planet Earth and dinosaurs all died. How do you have the nerve to tell us we are creating climate change? Do you have a way to keep them in a conversation to help them make the little changes that we can make? Yeah, I actually have, and I don't have that on the slideshow. I have one graph and it shows 400 million years of changes in CO2 and temperature and um, two oxygen isotopes, 400 million years past the dinosaurs, past the horseshoe crabs, past every creature, you know, way past uh, uh, the, the meteor. And you can see all of these events, the little ice ages, you can see the, di you know, the meteor hitting the earth and the, and the coolness that, that formed because of all of the material thrown up in the atmosphere. And you can see all these oscillations of the sun everything else that's happened in 400 million years. And behind that, you see this line going straight up. <laughs> and it is all, I mean, it is, you cannot miss it. It's just like being on a country road and having a NASCAR car driving by at 200 miles an hour. It blows everything out of the water and it's over and above and it's all linked to human inputs. So when we model that, we model the natural variations and the wobble of the earth, and the sun, solar spots, and volcanoes, which can cool the earth, everything that could possibly happen because scientists have known about it for hundreds of years. We show all of that and then we show these temperatures creeping up and basically ignoring all of this natural phenomenon and and not necessarily supernatural, but extra natural phenomenon like major meteorites. And you can see the human input right at the beginning of the industrial age start cranking up the CO2 and CO2 just rockets right past every other level it's ever been at. And you can see it in ice cores that go down, oh, about half a mile in the Arctic. So it's recorded uh, in little gas bubbles. You have gas bubbles that record the oxygen and the temperature and the phytoplankton. And you can't fake that. <laughs> it's not something we'd be pretty clever if we could do something like that. Well, they that. would probably say we fake it, but... <laughs> 
We can't yeah, take it, right? Absolutely. So you could Google that and, and look for um, Nantucket and is in Nantucket seeking or just, um, um, you know, um, anything related to climate change. I've written about it a lot. I do spend a lot of time going around the globe talking about climate change. And actually that talk got me into the Society of Women Geographers. Wow. And I and I just was the president of them last year. And that includes people like, you know, Amelia Earhart and Margaret Mead and wow. uh, Kathleen Sullivan and um, Sylvia Earle, who I just did an interview with. Um, so now, who's she? Sylvia Earle's a very famous oceanographer. She's called her deepness. She has been deeper than any other human for way more times. So she's been down in Alvin so many times. It's almost pedestrian for her. And uh, it's funny. We also have Kathleen Sul Sullivan, who's an astronaut and is also going down in things like Alvin to the, so she has the highest elevation uh, difference for any human being where Sylvia Earle has the most time spent on the ocean floor. Uh, so this group, the Society of Women uh, uh, Geographers, is all explorers, people who climbed Everest with babies on their backs in the 1950s and just crazy uh, women who are all very, uh, actually very hard to lead. <laughs> <laughs> very uh, feisty, lots of feisty women. So do you, have you created a, so, so say you get them to listen. Have you created, and they say, is there anything we can do? Have you created a little list of doables that we can do in everyday life? Yeah. And uh, one of the things I would do is follow someone called Catherine Hayhoe, who is a very famous climate scientist and the best communicator in the world on climate science. Hayhoe? So, Hayhoe, H-A-Y-H-O-E. Uh, I just uh, featured her in a talk not too long ago. She's fantastic. And literally the best of all of us. Uh, she's also an evangelistic Christian. So she gives a lot of talks that, that link why you can still be a Christian and believe in climate change. And she's a very good speaker. Mm -hmm. And we often get, you know, what can I do? Um, and it's, it's easy to feel um, like you just can't make a dent in it, mm -hmm. but each of us, uh, yeah, there's, there's actually a link to our discussion on YouTube. Great job, Shannon. Thank you. Um, yeah, you can Google that and there's you can see our whole conversation. But each of us has to do our part. It's very much like World War II. Each of us was, you know, saving nylons and, you know, not eating chocolate, right? And taking our cans. And we did this for the war effort. We need to mm -hmm. have a, a war on on carbon dioxide rises. I wouldn't say a war on climate change, because climate does change, um, but a, a war on excess use of resources. And, and there's lots of things. You can't do everything. Uh, I don't do everything. I eat meat, for instance, which is a big no-no. Um, but I drive a hybrid car. I recycle. I uh, spend a lot. I offset my carbon footprint. I try to use, uh, I don't try to buy new things. I try to buy used things. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with your diet. Your diet makes a big difference. Buying local makes a big difference. Thinking about the footprint of transportation for things you eat. Um, just and, and just trying to do the best that you can. If every person did the best they can, we could, we could fix this. The problem is a lot of people are like, well, you know, I'm just one person. I'm going to use like the styrofoam cup. Every time I see a styrofoam cup, I'm like, why is this crap still available? I mean, to me, it's <laughs> shocking, shockingly yeah. bad for the, you know, so if enough of us reject things like styrofoam containers and, um, you know, going up using elevators when we can walk. I mean, there's just a million things we can do. Most people say that, you know, the biggest changes you can make, uh, you know, one of them's a tough change, which is to not have children. Um, that's, you know, uh, most scientists like myself don't have children for that reason. Um, and when you talk to a normal human being, they're like, are you kidding? And we're like, nope, we're not kidding. Most of us have no children or have one child. So if you have fewer babies taking resources, you're helping. Um, eating pasture grazing meat is not a no-no. Correct. Yes, you can have pasture grazed meat. Um, soil health is huge and animals raised properly are part of the solution. They can be um, if they are raised properly and actually um, grazed in such a way that they contribute to to not adding to co2 there is a way to eat meat responsibly eating local meat 
eating meat where you know it came from. Um, there, there are proper ways to do that, but the lower you eat on the food chain, the better overall it is for the planet, the less resources, the less water that goes into it, the less fertilizers. Um, water is a biggie, how you use water. Um, what else would I say? Uh, yeah, so usually it's your transportation choices, your food choices, your children choices, um, and your educational choices. You know, the fact that to try to become more and more educated. There's a lot of little things that people do that they don't realize can hurt the planet. Um, a, a biggie is, and I have mixed feelings about it, beekeeping. Everyone's like, oh, I want to keep bees. And actually bees are um, European bees. They are not biodiverse bees from, so when people keep bees, you're buying um, invasive bees and bringing them to our land and they outcompete native naturalized honeybees. Interesting. So most scientists are not huge bee fans <laughs> because it's it sounds like it's nice, but when you when we do sampling for native bees, of which there's thousands of species, you know, we'll only find one for every 199 European honeybees that have been brought here to make honey. So it seems innocuous and it's it's actually not, it's not evil, it's just not great. You know, it doesn't help, it doesn't help biodiversity to 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 have a honey bees, unless you're having native honey bees, which very few people have. Native honey bees, okay. Thank you. So I hope you got some posters out. <laughs> Little yes. things to do. <laughs> I did. So we're at eight fifty four. I have a, a a essay on horseshoe crabs. It's a little long. I don't know if you guys want to hear another poem instead on oceanography, or you want to hear the uh, essay. You have um, to do horseshoe crabs because no, everyone no, I know wants to hear the horseshoe crab the crab voice. <laughs> Okay. Well, I have two articles on that. I will totally read that essay. Then. Okay. Here we go. And I wrote about them in 2009 and 2011, and Lenny has been out with me before. Um, all over the United States, we have been doing um, surveys in the middle of the night on uh, full moons and on mm. uh, new moons um, from Nova Scotia down to Florida to start counting horseshoe crabs. And what's ironic or iconic or sad is this is a creature like many creatures that people just never thought about. And so they were kind of ignored and considered junk or trash fish. And we've overexploited them horrendously to the point of where they're like 90% decimated in their population. But I will read this article. And I've combined two different articles into one because I would often get questions from people going, what the heck are you doing with waders on in the middle of the night? I see all of these lights out in the water and it's scaring me. <laughs> so, so this is the version I wrote in 2011 in June, uh, the week of June 9th through 15th. A few nights ago, I was walking with a friend chest deep in the salty surf at high tide at 2.44 a.m. Did I lose a bet? Am I an extremely creative sleepwalker? Nope just seeing how many horseshoe crabs are coming inshore to do what they have done for eons, which is to have crab relations, lay eggs, and continue the species. There's nothing more surreal than wading up to your chest in the pitch black new moon darkness along the beachfront with headlamps and lanterns looking for silent, ancient, living fossil creatures. Teams of volunteers from various scientific organizations on Nantucket are going out during the day and night at the times of the highest tides on the new and the full moon and two days before and after to measure the horseshoe crab population. We are part of a multi-state effort to count the number of spawning horseshoe crabs along our shorelines to determine how the population is doing. Many years ago, Nantucket's beaches, coves, and marshes were covered with horseshoe crabs. They were extremely abundant on the Cape and Island and throughout New England. Their numbers have declined over the past de few decades due to a combination of factors, including overfishing, excess mortality occurred, occurring from harvesting them for their blood and habitat what? loss. Yep, we'll get to that. We actually... Oh my God, I didn't realize I wasn't muted. I'm sorry. Oh no, that's okay. <laughs> I actually love that. That's awesome. <laughs> it's creepy. Yes, we actually, uh, we have vampirized uh, horseshoe crabs. So we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> 
Horseshoe crabs are sometimes referred to as living fossils, which are defined as species who have not changed much from their ev ancient evolutionary roots and yet have very few close living relatives and few branches protruding from their phylogenetic tree. You might be surprised to find out how many plants and animals as diverse as the ginkgo tree, the koala, and the nautilus are classified as living fossils. Mm. No other creature than the horseshoe crab has remained so close to its early form and shape. The horseshoe crab has been relatively unchanged since the Triassic period 230 million years ago, and similar species were present in the Devonian, which is 400 million years ago. Horseshoe crabs are the closest living relatives of the now extinct trilobite. Despite their common name, they're not crabs at all, but are in the phylum Arthropoda, think spider, animals having an articulated body and limbs, which include insects, arachnids, and crustaceans. Horseshoe crabs are in their own class called meristomata, or legs attached to the mouth. There are only four living species of the horseshoe crab family. Our local creature and the most abundant of the species is called Limulus polyphemus, and three species found in the Indo-Pacific. L. polyphemus is found along the Western Atlantic and Gulf Coast from Southern Maine to the Yucatan Peninsula with the Delaware Bay as the center of the population. Because Delaware Bay is the center of the population, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources has the most information on horseshoe crabs. And they tell us each major estuary along the coast is believed to have a discrete horseshoe crab population that can be distinguished by adult size, carapace color, or their shell, and eye pigmentation. In fact, Cape Cod Bay horseshoe crabs can be distinguished from Nantucket Sound ones. The horseshoe crab was first named by Carl Linnaeus, who's a Swedish botanist, physician, and zoologist who laid the foundations for the modern scheme of binomial nomenclature, two-part names that are often Latinized, like Limonolus polyphemus. Linnaeus is known as the father of modern taxonomy and is also considered one of the fathers of modern ecology. At the time of his death, he was renowned throughout Europe as one of the most acclaimed scientists of the time, and his system for naming, ranking, and classifying organisms is still in wide use today. Linnaeus is a fascinating person. I highly recommend learning more about him. He named these creatures Lim Limulus polyphemus. The genus from the Latin means something oblique, odd, or askew, and refers to the sideways placement of the compound eyes. The term polyphemus from the Greek means one-eyed giant and refers to the simple eyes in the front of the shell. So horseshoe crabs have several pairs of eyes, two large compound eyes on the prosoma or the head area, are sensitized to polarized lights and can magnify sunlight 10 times. A pair of simple eyes on the forward side of the prosoma can sense ultraviolet light from the moon. In addition, multiple eye spots are located under the prosoma with more on the underside of their tail. Horseshoe crabs occasionally swim upside down, which is quite weird, and may once have used those eyes more than they do today. See evidence that we're gonna talk about in a moment about finding out waiter boots are not girlfriends. Horseshoe crabs have three main parts to their body. The head region, which I've been talking about, known as the prosoma, the abdominal region, or the episthoma, I'm so bad at pronouncing things, Opus the soma, which is attached to the head by a hinge, so they can hinge. Spine like. It is the tail that earns this order its name, Xyphosura, which derives from the Greek for sword tail. The sexes are similar in appearance, but females are much larger than males. Females are about this big, you know, about turkey platter size and males are about dinner plate size. It's amazing. They could get bigger. You, they can get big enough, you can ride them. The carapace is shaped like a horseshoe, of course, and is greenish gray to dark brown in color. On the underside of the prosoma, the head region are the six pairs of appendages. This is, the more you look at them, the more you can understand how they're related to things like lobsters or like um, spiders. Um, 
the six pairs appendages, the first of which are the, called the chelicera, which is common in any kind of arthropoda, are used to pass food into the mouth. The second pair, the pedipalps, are used as walking legs. In males, they're tipped with claspers that look like little boxing gloves, which they use to hang on to the female, which takes them for a ride, and they're used during mating. The remaining four pairs of appendages are the pusher legs, also used in locomotion, and they look like little locomotive legs. You can't miss it. The opisthosoma bears a further six pairs of appendages. The first pair houses the genital pores, while the remaining five pairs are modified into flat plates known as book gills, which are used in breathing. So these book gills are flaps that resemble a page of a book and are pretty, pretty neat, and they allow them to get oxygen from the water. If the primitive gills stay moist, horseshoe crabs can remain out of water up to four days. Mm. Crabs stranded on the beach during spawning bury themselves in the sand or fold themselves in half to conserve water until the tide rises again. Horseshoe crabs have no jaws or teeth. Instead, they have an array of spiny mouth bristles at the base of five pairs of legs to maneuver food items such as razor clams, soft shell clams, and marine worms into their centrally located mouth. To chew its food, the crab must stimulate walking movements. Horseshoe crab eggs and larvae are a seasonal food item of invertebrates and fish. Striped bass and white perch eat them. American eel, killifish, silver perch, weak fish, kingfish, almost any fish you can think of. Flounders, many crab species, and several gastropods, including whelks, which are the big snail things, eat eggs and larvae. Many sea turtles eat them. Abundant stocks of adult horseshoe crabs may be an important component of ensuring the long-term survival of loggerhead sea turtles in the Delaware and Chesapeake Bays. Horseshoe crabs were the inspiration for the vocal effects provided by voice master Peter Cullen in the 1987 and subsequent Predator horror science fiction movies. In an interview, Cullen says, as I watched the predator take off his helmet, I remembered the sounds of an upside down horseshoe crab bubbling in the sun. The sounds of the clicking, bursting bubbles came to me. The horrible underside of the dying crab and the face of the predator just intertwined. Rumor has it that H.R. Giger, the designer of the alien xenomorph, drew the face hugger based on a horseshoe crab anatomy, but that's a coincidence. The actual design was based on a combination of two hands and, if you must know, human naughty bits. And this correlation brings us back to why they are so abundant along our beaches in May and June. Like many creatures, the only time you can find them is when they come ashore to mate. Horseshoe crabs like to be offshore most of the time. They spend their winter in deep bay waters and offshore areas. The crab spawning season varies according to latitude, but it generally peaks at least in the Boston and Nantucket area in May and June, with peak spawning occurring on evening high tides during the full and new moons, the higher than normal spring tides. And that makes sense if you think about it because they use the intertidal area to lay their eggs. So the high tides, more of that area is wet and provides more spawning area. The adults seek beaches that are at least partially protected from surf within bays and coves. When the lemuli head for shore, the males patrol along the foot of the beach awaiting the females. They literally just pace up and down the beach. The female horseshoes um, crabs give off chemical attractants called pheromones, which the males can detect. Although there may be other means of identification, these attractants, the directional movement and the number of males involved, often several times the number of females, reduce the chance of a female reaching the beach without a boyfriend or two. Males who are 30% smaller than females use those boxer gloves to clasp onto the back of the female. Female front appendages look a bit like feather dusters. Sometimes several males will attempt to attach to a female and will form clusters with satellite males just jostling for position. During our surveys, we find that as we walk around to the water with waders, our feet will become irresistible female-like objects to any circling males, which quickly demonstrate that sight is not their most highly developed sense. By the beginning of the spawning season, each female will have developed about 80,000 to 100,000 eggs which are located in dense masses near the front of her shell. She'll return to the beach on successive tides, laying four to five clutches of eggs with each tide. Each cluster contains about 4,000 eggs, and a female will lay about 20 egg clusters each year. 
newly laid horseshoe crab eggs are opaque, pastel green in color, and about 1 16th of an inch in diameter. It takes two weeks for the horseshoe crab to progress from egg to larva to hatchling. There's a very cool video that shows that happening. It's a little creepy, but cool. If an egg is exposed to air for long, it will dry out, but it will form an important source of food to migrating shorebirds. In fact, it's a primary source of food for a couple of shorebirds. Some folks aren't aware that horseshoe crabs molt, just like spiders molt. So they can't get bigger because they're in an exoskeleton. So in order to get bigger, they have to shed that skeleton. So when you're walking in an area along the shore, like a bordering marsh, and you find all those little shells of horseshoe crabs, you're not finding a million dead ones. You're finding all of their molts. You're finding the leftovers after the crab wriggles out of its too small shell in order to become larger. Horseshoe mm -hmm. crabs will molt at least six times in the first year of life and about 18 times before they reach sexual maturity. Females molt more than males to reach their larger size. Once crabs are sexually mature, which takes about nine years, they won't shed their shells again. After that point, they'll carry a variety of hitchhikers during their journey, kind of like the world's oldest country squire station wagon. The typical five to 10 year old horseshoe crab has slipper shells and particles and algae growing on the top of the shell. I explained to my students that many of the mollusks and snails, the horseshoe crab is a convenient movable platform that helps keep them safe and move them closer to food. Tiny crabs may hide on the inside lip of the shell, and the limulus leech is a flatworm that is found along the book gills and leg joints of crabs, especially in older females that have not shed for a long time. They can, adult crabs can live eight to 10 years, making the total lifespan of a horseshoe crab as long as 20 years. The most bizarre feature of horseshoe crabs, and the thing that makes them the most valuable, is their copper-based blood, which turns blue as opposed to red when it encounters oxygen. In other words, they are blue bloods. They are not iron-based. Researchers at the Marine Biological Lab at Woods Hole found that bacteria injected into horseshoe crabs triggered a gram-negative bacterial toxin called endotoxin to form clots around the bacteria. These investigators were able to localize the clotting phenomenon in the blood cells called the mepocytes of the horseshoe crab. So this reaction was then used to look for endotoxins, which are very dangerous pathogens in a variety of pharmaceutical and medical devices to ensure they were not contaminated. So this is like the spray you see in movies where it shows under UV light where something's occurred. This blood actually has a natural ability to indicate when bacterial substances are present that can be serious like SARS or MERS or any of the or various types of bacteria that can kill people. So horseshoe crab blood quickly became a commodity. They're collected using dredges or clam rakes or by hand, packed into trucks, sometimes refrigerated and driven to labs, hung up on little things to have one third of their blood removed and returned to the ocean. Some studies estimate 10 to 15% of animals do not survive the bleeding procedure, which accounts for the mortality of about 20,000 to 37,000 horseshoe crabs per year. Blood volume returns to normal in about a week, though blood cell count can take two to three months to fully rebound. A single horseshoe crab can be worth $2,500 over its lifetime for periodic blood extractions. And in one case, one quarter horseshoe crab blood might be worth $15,000. This is an animal obviously worth protecting. Because of the lucrative market in their blood and the abuse of their collection as bait for conch and lobster fisheries, it's illegal in some states to harvest or even possess a live one without a proven scientific purpose. Back in the day, uh, certainly on Nantucket, um, fishermen would just drive up with their trucks and load them into the trucks and then chop them into quarters for lobster bait. They were considered junk or trash fish. Their eggs are an important source of food for shorebirds, especially birds like the red knot. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, more than half of the total flyway population of red knots, ready turnstones, and semi-palmated sandpipers depend on Delaware Bay's horseshoe crab eggs as a rich food supply. A reduction in horseshoe crab population cascades through the population of the birds and other creatures who depend on their eggs for food. 
A drop in red knot populations was the first clue we were impacting horseshoe crab populations. So birders were the first ones to raise the alarm. There's an incredible book about horseshoe crabs, and I am blanking on the name, but it came out about five or 10 years ago that goes into great detail on this. I've actually met the author, and I'm sorry that it might be Wendy Williams, it might be somebody else. People have harvested horseshoe crabs for centuries, though. Prior to the European colonization of North American, native tribes used the telson or the tip as spear tips and used the shell as containers, kind of like people do with armadillos. These small and localized harvests had little impact on horseshoe crab, crab populations. But in the late 1800s and early 1900s, up to 4 million horseshoe crabs were harvested annually and used as fertilizer or animal food. And once again, they just chop them up and stick them in their gardens. They were known as junk or trash fish, which is wrong on both counts. Currently, crabs are harvested for bait and conch and American eel fisheries on the Atlantic coast. They suffered a substantial increase in harvest in the 1990s that spurred the need for management on a coastwide scale. And finally, in 1998, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, representing 15 states from Maine to Florida, developed a horseshoe crab management plan, which freaked out a lot of people. This plan and its subsequent agenda, addendas established mandatory state-by-state -state harvest quotas and created the 1500 square mile Carl Schuster Jr. Horseshoe Crab Sanctuary off the mouth of Delaware Bay. A combination of management efforts, research into alternatives for bait for conch fishermen and harvest quotas have started to slowly turn the tide for these creatures. The recovery will take some time because it takes a long time for each horseshoe crab to stop breeding. They also have been working on synthetic alternatives to their blood. As an example of how much this population was decimated, at one time, I was said you could almost run across Nantucket Harbor. There would be 50,000 to 100,000 horseshoe crabs in May. The first year we started counting them, which was in 2009, we counted 30. So they were almost wiped out. Not much is known about where horseshoe crabs go other than deeper waters when they're not entertaining us on shore. Their main strategy to avoid predators is to be active at night, feeding and spawning under the cover of darkness. In fact, during spawning season, you'll find 100 times more crabs on shore at night than during the day. During high tide, when large aquatic predators are swimming nearby, the juvenile horseshoe crabs bury themselves in the sand for protection. At low tide, young horseshoe crabs emerge from the sediment, but now they must be cautious of predators on the shore. If crabs are turned upside down, you will, they will use their telson to flip over. This movement always reminds me of a slow-moving windshield wiper. The need for them to keep their telson intact is the primary reason why you should never pick up a horseshoe crab by its tail. Instead, lift it by the shell and flip it back over, avoiding the telson, which could stab you. Shorebirds cannot penetrate the horseshoe crab's coat of armor as long as the crab is upright. Let's let them live to be another around another millennia or more. Hey, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I just heard so many people talking about that article in particular. So I actually am now living right near the Delaware Bay and just went with my dog to Slaughter Beach, which in 2004 voted themselves to be a horseshoe crab sanctuary. And they have horseshoe crab, a horseshoe crab flipper club oh. <laughs> that during May and June go out to the beach and flip them back over. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh. And they can flip themselves over if people leave them alone, but it just kills me when kids try to grab them by the tail. And it's the same uh, thing people do with manta rays and stingrays. And there's some, there's some sense to it because you want to grab the one part that can hurt you and make sure you have that under control. <laughs> but, you know, you can see uh, them swinging on that poor little cartilage and you can tell it's not good for them. Right, right. <clears throat> I put a link in the chat for um for a possible book by uh victoria crescent crenson that's Horseshoe one of the two yeah okay. the uh, crab wars is the one which is william Sargent, and horseshoe crabs and velvet worms is one um i'm trying to think of maybe that's the that must be the one it must be the velvet worm one there's one that really uh concentrates on the red knots and horseshoe 
that really, it was funny because people were like, why aren't we seeing these birds anymore? And right. they were like, oh, they, they're eating this one creature that's almost completely gone. And it was considered a crash of that red knots and horseshoe crabs were not, I'm trying to find the actual, but yeah, it might be the velvet. Oh, it, I'm wondering if it's just called red knots and horseshoe crabs, but yeah, there's a, it, they, it became very uh, uh, popular subject. And this is a well-written book. A lot of people really like this book. The Crab Wars is by Bill Sargent, who is a local Cape Island, a Cape uh, um, author that's written on both erosions and crabs. I remember seeing a lot of them at Eel Point on Nantucket uh, in the 90s. I'd go out there and they would just be like skimming along. The, uh, they would go on the shore and then they would swim out and make this arc and come back about like a crescent and they would be doing these crescents along Eel Point. You know. Could you tell if they were small or big? It's probably the males. They, were... Well, I would maybe about a foot, you know, yeah. Foot around, yeah. Some were, well, I've never saw any real big ones, but you know, they looked like, they all looked fairly similar in size, but I was just fascinated by the way they would just sort of glide out and make these perfect arcs. And I was, what, what's up with that, you know? Um, that's definitely the guys, that's the boys doing I, doing that pacing. Doing I think that. they were chasing, do they, the guys chase the girls? They actually the set up, uh, they set up this barricade basically. So the females are coming ashore almost like Normandy and the males are doing this beautiful dance, like you're saying, but they are keeping a barricade. So uh, one foot is probably going to be a male. I mean, the females are about two, two feet. Oh yeah. These were, then these were males. Yeah. They, they, yeah. Uh, interesting. I love it. It's my favorite term of the night, crab relations. <laughs> I stick a few innuendos. It's like and, cruise. Uh, it's like cruise night on a downtown main drag. Absolutely. They're just going to go back and forth and back and forth. Well, when you see one giant female with like six males on it, and then you'll see this seventh male like circling, going, "Come on, guys, let me get in there." It's it's you kind of feel sorry for her, but she's that she's so much stronger and so much bigger that if she gets tired of all the action, she can just pretty much shake all but one or two of them off and she just takes off they can they can swim really quite fast um, mm -hmm. i've seen really big ones where if you you could grab hold of her almost like you would with a turtle not that you should do that with either thing uh and they could drag you uh, they're they're wow. su they're surprisingly strong um yeah it's a little creepy to be out there in the pitch dark with all of them circling your feet because you're counting, you're literally counting them, which sounds easy and it is not. So we have a whole grid <gasps> pattern and you're walking and counting how many couples, how many singles, how many clusters. Do they uh, present any danger? I mean, do they bite? Do they pretty much just ignore humans? Yeah, they're going to ignore humans. I mean, if you like fell on one inappropriately with its telson up, you know, you might hurt yourself. But no, they're not going to hurt you. It's just mm -hmm. very even though you know they're really gentle, it's kind of like walking around with, well, elephants can actually be dangerous. I'm trying to think of another creature. Oh, many stingrays and manta rays. There's lots of mandas that can't hurt you, but they're mm -hmm. still such big creatures. Just like, yeah. And it's, you don't think they're going to hurt you, but you're, you're very cognizant that you're in high. So this is on a high, high tide. So let's say every day you're used to walking out and being up to your waist in water. Mm -hmm. Now you're up to your neck in water that you're normally only up to your waist. Mm -hmm. And so that difference in tide is, it, you usually have no beach at all. The high tide is up into the, the marshy areas. And so it's, uh, it's definitely, um, it's surreal. It's very surreal. It could be mm -hmm. very beautiful. Some of my most beautiful times in the water have been late at night with these horseshoe crabs. They're very elegant, but you're very cognizant of how high the tide is. And if there's any kind of waves or anything, it's a, it's a little hard to keep your feet. Mm -hmm. Can you say mm -hmm. something a little bit more about the eyes? I mean, it, the, the front eye, the one that you always kind of notice is, is so beautifully sculpted. I guess I've never noticed anything else. The reason for so much ways of getting in 
She had nine different ways in Shannon. Way to go to put the the both the front and the back carapace. You rock. Uh, she's got it going on there. So it's got a total of nine eyes, and they're they're arranged to see both polarized light and to see UV light. So they're 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 really highly adapted. I'm I'm actually surprised they don't do more research on their eyes, uh, like they do with squid eyes, which have you know like one of the biggest accents in nature. Um, but so they can see both at low light conditions, which they need to. So a new moon, it is pitch dark, pitch, pitch dark out there. And they don't have a whole lot of, you know, olfactory senses. They can sense some pheromones, but it's not like they are, you know, um, bloodhounds out there. <laughs> so um, they, you know, the eyes and the feeling the currents are going to help. So altogether, they have nine eyes, including several light sensors along their tail mm. so they actually can sense light at three or four spots along their tails and they have two under the prosoma that are simple eyes and then they have two more that are very close to that that are i think one ridge over that can sense ultraviolet light and then they have a couple more sets behind that that are probably a combination once you start thinking about the eyes you could really start seeing the the relationships to spiders more right because spiders really depend on having so many and so many different types of eyes that bring in light of all kinds of spectrums so mm -hmm. it makes sense that a the a creature that's dealing it very dark conditions and it's also really tied to the lunar cycles needs to have um, and, and an animal that's buried in the mud so these also have to be eyes that can handle being shoved into the mud and they get really shoved in there if you've ever pulled a, a lot of times they really bury themselves into the high tide big time you're like how did you get in there um, <laughs> there you know it's not if you really have to get extract a large female from the tide it's not an easy task mm. so i think it's cool that they have so many and, and it sounds like they have a and, and part of this probably and i'm not a biologist i'm a chemist the more i <laughs> can repeat that the better so i'm not a biologist so this is all me trying to learn more about biology and and um, but evolutionarily it's been around for 400 million years right so obviously whatever's worked for it has really worked for it it hasn't evolved into different types of eyes so it started out with all of these choices for eyes and then kept them all <laughs> it's remarkable <laughs> Yeah, to have so little changed, uh, you can yeah. see, you know, when you go and see fossils from 300, 400 million years ago, they look just like they do now. It's amazing. There's nothing else that's, that's you know, that survived in that little change. Is it because they just were perfect that they never had to change? Yeah, they were pretty simple. They had a lot of uh, ways of, of reproducing, you know, and they just, it was one of those, don't, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have been one of those broken, you know, a lot of times you'll get these really short uh, branches from the tree of life, you know, the phylogenetic tree, and it just doesn't branch off very often, you know, for a variety of reasons, but uh, it's had opportunities to branch. And the fact that there's only four species is it's also amazing. really interesting. Yeah. Because most, most other creatures have, you know, hundreds of species. So yeah, it's just, well, was a in other words, it's very rare. This, this non-changing over so many Yeah, years. yes, that's it's extremely rare. rare. This is really the only thing that's changed. And the Nautilus is pretty close. There is a living that's Nautilus that's, that's almost hard. identical. The ginkgo tree has almost changed very, very little. And then the koala has changed in the last 100 million years since it's a mammal. I mean, it's, it's, it's got a much shorter time and mm -hmm. geologic time. But yeah, there's nothing that's that has existed. No worms, no crinoids no sea slugs that has existed with this little changes there, there's a few more prime primordial funguses that haven't changed much mm -hmm. a couple of very simple plants but something in the animal kingdom not not so much yeah. mm -hmm. that's what i think makes it even more tragic that we almost wiped them out i'm like how how silly of, of us to Can you imagine they go that they survive so long and then yeah 400 million years you know including meteorites and then you know nuclear winter you know every, everything that we've thrown out at it, ice ages and everything and 
Well, thank you guys all for coming. Yeah. I hope you had fun and learned things. And thank um, you. You can, you know, look for my book and, and just Google if you have any questions, you know, like oak tie and mosquitoes or oak tie and erosion or sea level rise, both all of my articles on sea level rise should come up, uh, which have links to all of those. And the toughest thing about putting these essays together into books is making sure all the links still work. And the fact mm -hmm. that the numbers have changed so much. So I'm trying to make the books halfway timely. So. Oh, yay. Thanks so thank much. you. <laughs> Thanks. Richard, thank you so much for having me here.